in. All right. All righty, all righty. Hello, everybody. What's welcome, up? welcome. Thank you all for joining us. Good to have you here. We'll wait just a couple of seconds to let folks join in before we get started with the good time we're about to have this morning slash afternoon. Again, thank you so much to everyone for joining us this, uh, this beautiful day. Um, at least here in Georgia where I am, it's nice and bright and sunny. Uh, while you're filing in, if you would like to share some cool bird uh, experiences that you've had recently, we welcome that. Um, and if you're tuning in from different parts of the country or world, feel free to drop in the chat where you're tuning in from. We'd love to see where everyone is joining us from uh, this afternoon. Um, if you would like to use closed captions, you can go ahead and enable them by selecting the CC button at the bottom of your screen. And I will also put those instructions in the chat. Um, and we'll get started in just a minute. We've got folks um, from the hill country of Texas. Uh, we've got someone from the UK, Alex, thanks for joining us. Minneapolis, Minnesota, uh, Melissa, good to have you here. Uh, we've got someone from central Oklahoma, Kirsten, nice to have you. Um, we are glad to see so many folks from around the country joining us and around the world. Um, we've got Terrence from just outside of New Orleans, Louisiana. Very, very awesome. Boston in the house. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Great. Um, well, it's so great to have you all here. Got someone from uh, Renee from North Carolina. Good to see you in the place today. All right, so we are gonna go ahead and get started. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to this virtual accessible field trip that's co-hosted by Georgia Audubon and BirdAbility. Georgia Audubon is dedicated to building places where birds and people thrive here in the state of Georgia. Um, and BirdAbility is dedicated to making birds accessible, birding accessible for everybody. And Freya McGregor, who is here with us today, will tell you a little bit more about BirdAbility in just a second. Um, but this afternoon, we are going to be traveling in four different parts of the country. And I'm gonna let um, all of our guests tell you exactly where they are. Um, we're going to be exploring the birds and avian biodiversity in the places that we're birding this afternoon. Um, we're going to share features about the trails that we're on that make it accessible um, or inaccessible, if that is the case where any of us are located. Um, and we're going to be uh, sharing the stories um, directly from our two special guests today, Joseph Saunders um, and Emerson Milam, um, who are going to be talking about their experiences as birders who experience um, accessibility challenges um, or have disabilities um, and uh, offering their, their insight around how we can make birding accessible for everybody. Um, so I'm Karina Newsom. I'm the Community Engagement Manager here at Georgia Audubon and I am birding from Westside Park in the west side of Atlanta that is a very accessible um, location that has lots of accessible trails and lots of different kinds of birds and I'm excited to be able to share those with you today. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to um, Joseph, I know you've got, you've got your eyes on something, Joseph, so <laughs> not to put you on, yeah. on the spot, uh, but tell us about no, you and where you're birding cool. from. All right, so um, as I said, um, my name is Joseph Saunders. I'm birding from Lake Hefner in uh, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Um, I am a paraplegic. I was born with spina bifida. Uh, my injury level is T12 to L1. Um, so I have uh, most of my... Um, upper body function and some um, lower lower body function as well. Um, I bir I'm birding today by, by vehicle and my vehicle is set up so that it has hand controls that control the, uh, the acceleration and the brake as well. Um, it allows me to drive independently. And uh, with lakes like this one here, there's an, a wonderful road that basically goes along the uh, sections of the, the shoreline that allows me to get pretty close to many species. So I'm looking at a flock of a couple of hundred different ducks right now. And even that's why I was distracted. And there was a bald eagle flying overhead just a moment ago. Um, my pronouns are he, him, and they, them. And I suppose that's probably about enough about me. Awesome. Thanks so much, Joseph, uh, for that introduction. And 
please forgive me for forgetting to say my pronouns. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, so why don't we pass it over to Emerson to introduce herself um, as we get started. Hello. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm so excited to be here with all of you. Ooh, my, ooh. Um, my name is Emerson Milam. I use she, her, hers pronouns, and I am birding with you all today from Huntley Meadows, which is this awesome, um, beautiful wetland. Let me turn my camera around and show you just how beautiful this is. This is indigenous Potomac um, land. They were the original caretakers. Right now it's currently um, moderated by a nice family of beavers. It is a wonderfully accessible trail for myself um, and my uh, access challenges, which include chronic Lyme disease and um, ADHD and some other neurological stuff like that. Um, and, you know, general anxiety and depression from having a chronic illness. Um, I'm currently looking at a group of Northern shovelers and they're being so silly. Let me see if I can get them on here real quick. They're just no, paddling. Just saw... big. They got really big bills um, as the shoveler would kind of cue you in on. They look like giant shovels. Um, so that's that's me. Um, I think we're over to Freya now. Hi everyone. Like um, my name is oh. Freya McGregor, but yes, oh. Joseph, tell us what you got. I I have not been able to spot it a second time, but I just saw a common loon. <gasps> And that is, that's uncommon for the area. We get like one or two a year, usually at Lake Hefter, and that's about it. Um, and I just spotted it, it, it probably just arrived within like the last couple of days with this influx of uh, other ducks. And y'all, if, if you know, they're, they're a larger uh, water bird and they are built for underwater swimming and hunting and they can dive for long periods of time. And I spotted it and then it disappeared. So it's probably underwater and it's going to pop up somewhere like 200 yards away from here. And I'm, I'm hoping to be able to find it again. That's so cool, Joseph. <laughs> Thank, thanks for letting us know. Um, so we'll go ahead and pass it on to Freya. And Freya, after you introduce yourself, if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit about birdability and how it came to be as well. Sure, yeah. So Joseph, if you if that common loon gets back into view, please feel free to interrupt my introduction and um, we'll get, get a look at this this loon. Um, hello everyone, my name is Freya McGregor. Um, my pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm the Vetability Coordinator. Um, Vetability is a brand new nonprofit um, and we're all about sharing the joys of birding with people who have disabilities and other health concerns. Um, it was founded by Virginia Rose, who's a manual wheelchair user in Texas. Um, I'm an occupational therapist. I'm the solo <laughs> staff person at Birdability. We've been a nonprofit just since January this year. So um, lots of exciting things happening. And big thanks to George Audubon uh, and Karina for um, these, this op opportunity to um, go birding in four places at once and maybe bring some birds into people's homes who maybe can't get out birding as easily. Um, as well as amplifying the stories of people and highlighting accessible tracks is a pretty awesome, awesome thing. The archaeological park, which is just south of Tuscaloosa, like 20 minutes south of Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Um, I'll go back and show you there's, there's a huge amount of mounds from, um, built by the, um, uh, Oh, Freya, I think you're breaking up just a little bit. Um, the 100 to 1 AD, uh, it's quite amazing. But um, this little trail here, I'm on a boardwalk. Um, I can talk a bit more about that later. Um, I have a dodgy knee. That's my access challenge. Um, it's really funky. It's like, it's doing well today, but it might not in half an hour. So uh, benches are really important for me. And um, I'm birding here with my husband, Patrick, but he's gone looking for birds. So um, <laughs> he might find us some um, shortly. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you all so much for introducing yourselves. Um, again, thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. We are going birding um, in Virginia, Alabama, Oklahoma, and Georgia, exploring birds and um, talking about the ways that birding um, can be and can be more accessible for people, um, for everybody, in particular those who have experienced access challenges. Um, now, again, during this trip, because we're all birding, we may intersect each other and shout out with the birds that we're seeing, and that's okay. Um, but right now, as we're going, 
Does anyone have birds they want to point out before I ask you a few questions? I'll leave space just in case. Well, right now I am currently hearing the sound. Oh, who has one? Go ahead. I'll I'll, uh, I'll give a quick pan of uh, some of these ducks that I'm seeing. It's, it's not going to be a lot of detail, but. I mean, when y'all actually have a pretty good visual, it's kind of hard for me to tell on mine if y'all can see the LED screen on the back of my camera. Oh, yeah. This is some of the dust that I'm actually seeing out here today. Uh, Look at those is, things. As I mentioned before, this is a group of, like, I've seen scalp in this um, amongst them, and there are red-headed ducks and buffalo heads. Think, I don't think that I spotted any there. There is a loon in there somewhere. Either either that or he like swam off, and I, I don't know where he's gone off to at this point. Um, and I'm hoping that that bald eagle will do another flyby here, and I'll try to actually get uh, a visual on that one um, if that happens. I have a pair of. Um, hooded mergansers. Ooh, they just came oh, back out jealous. behind. Uh, I think it's an old beaver lodge, actually. Where'd they go? They're kind of in the middle of the screen. And um, they had this wonderful big black blobby head with this brilliant white contrast on it. And the females are significantly more muted and brown, um, which honestly, I kind of like the muted female birds better than the big flashy ones. <laughs> They've got some pretty rad, like orange red hair going on with the females. Like, yeah, they, 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 they have that really nice crest on them too, and then it's like all bright orange compared to the more brownish body. But they're they are pretty. Hey, yo! I don't have any birds right now, but I just wanted to share with you a little bit about this accessible trail because I kind of came to the end of it already, um, and I'm going to head down towards the Black Warrior River and try and find birds. But while I'm here, I'm just going to turn my camera around. So this boardwalk, um, boardwalks are usually pretty good at being accessible for many folks with um, disabilities and other health concerns because they tend to be flat, they tend to be wide, and they tend to have quite a smooth surface. Although if, if um, there's a hole in the boardwalk or um, one of the boards like flicks up, that's a trip hazard and you know a safety concern. But on this boardwalk, um, this is an interesting thing. This little kind of weird kind of gate, like garden gate sized piece of fence. Um, it's gonna be here designed to stop cars or anything drive down that boardwalk. But um, I'm glad to see, just judging by the distance, um, this should be, because I'm, I'm used to doing this, <laughs> this should be enough space between the edge of this uh, obstacle and the edge, like the, the wall here. Um, sometimes bollards and things are put at the start of boardwalks or trails to try and stop um, cars and stuff going down them, but they sometimes are put in such a place that um, wheelchairs, power wheelchairs, manual wheelchairs, scooters, you know, um, can't actually get through, even though those those trail users are probably not supposed to be excluded from that trail. They're just being misplaced. So um, if you ever notice anything like that in your birding and exploring and you want to tell the, the park managers or, or um, the local, the county parks people or whoever, um, that's a really good way to help um, advocate for change because often they don't realise that they've made something inaccessible and um, and they really appreciate that feedback. If you can do it in a positive, like, hey, let's make this better kind of way. Um, so that's a really great way to be an ally and help improve this stuff. Um, there's lots of resources on the BirdAbility website, birdability.org, um, to help you learn more about what makes up a truly accessible trail and, and things like that. So um, yeah, this, this is great. There's nothing wrong here, but, but um, that's a really cool thing to do. My husband just sent me a text to say he has a hawk in the scope, so I'm going to race down there and see if we can share that with y'all. Yes, absolutely. And I just put into the chat a link to Breadability's website where you can look um, and uh, find resources that help you to even have language for 
advocating for accessible features to the to the locations that you go birding um, and to identify locations that need accessibility upgrades like Freya was just describing. So that link is in the chat. Um, now, while we are all kind of uh, traversing our different locations, Joseph, I see, oh, okay, I just wanna make sure you weren't about to put something in the in the scope. Um, one thing that I wanted to I, I, ask, oh. I, 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 I had for a second. I, I just I didn't want to interrupt because I mean, for, at least for me, it was like really common. But like a small little flock of uh, Amer American coots just swam by. Yes. So we if, if you were watching my if you were watching my screen, you saw that. So. Okay. Okay. <laughs> cool. Um, well, as we're going down, and Freya is going to look for the hawk in the scope. Um, I wanted to ask, in particular, Joseph um, and Emerson, um, what are some of the specific either instances or patterns that you've seen that have made uh, birding or birding experiences inaccessible for you um, in any of your experiences as an outdoor explorer or as a birder in particular? Um, and feel free, either Joseph or Emerson, who wants, whoever wants to jump in first, feel free. Karina, you kind of cut out there for a second, but I think um, the gist of it was you're, you're asking about um, essentially kind of what barriers we experience that make certain locations inaccessible to us? Locations or even experiences um, inaccessible, yes. Sorry about cutting out. Um, I think for me, the biggest thing, my, my biggest gripe is, is the way that the trails are actually made. I see a lot of effort that goes into making trails and the trails are never really seem to be made with people who use chairs in mind. Um, and that's probably, that, that's, probably the biggest frustration because it's like it's there i know that that the labor was all off all was obviously put into it um but there wasn't enough consideration to actually make it usable uh and that that's really about it i mean trails need to be a little bit wider they need to be uh packed hard ground and even with that they don't have to be necessarily cemented or like paved in a lot of cases when it comes to natural spaces because you know, when you do introduce those kinds of things, it can get destructive to the habitat, and I, I don't want that either. Um, but thing, uh, but I do know that things like hard patch ground and a little bit wider and a little bit more effort to kind of make those trails as level as possible is a possibility, and it, the, the effort and labor just doesn't go into it. Thank you so much for sharing that, Joseph. Um, Emerson. Yeah, so my accessibility challenges are less to do with like the physical aspects of the trail um more so because my challenges spawn from the chronic fatigue widespread chronic pain that'll come up randomly um with the chronic lyme disease and so a lot of the issues and patterns that i have noticed is that not having information and so um i am fortunate to where i can um, be my own advocate and I can make sure that I have the things I need in order to have a successful outing or um, if I find myself like halfway out of trail and like exhausted and need to take a nap like those are things that I can do for myself um, so really just like and bird ability has been a huge asset with this that's actually kind of how um, I got back into birding was because having that kind of oh here's a big hawk what is this Hey, um, Emerson, sorry to interrupt. I've got a hawk in my scope and I don't want it to fly away because this is like a pretty go sweet it, view. Um, go for it, I go. Think, I think it's a red-tailed hawk. I'm, I think. Uh, I can't see its tail. I, it seems yes. to have a belly band. It looks like a red-tailed hawk to me. Um, hanging out on the top of this pine tree. I'm aware next to, if I pull away from the scope, I'm worried I'm going to lose this view. Um, <laughs> this is the Black Warrior River. Um, a big, big river that flows through Tuscaloosa. Um, I saw someone in the chat. I'm at Manville Archaeological Park, um, which is just south of Tuscaloosa. And oh, there's a car down there. I guess they've been boating. Anyway, there's the the hawk is in is right there. Um, <laughs> but the power of optics. Um, here we go. There he is. Oh, magic! I don't know if I'm going to get another bird so easily seen today. So I just sorry sorry to interrupt you, Emerson. I just wanted to make sure everyone got to see this spectacular creature. And um, please, please keep sharing, Emerson. <laughs> Freya, would you mind? Oh, I was going to say, would you mind describing a little bit of the um, the the features of red tail hawks? They kind of make them red tail hawks. Um, well, sure. Um, 
red tailed hawks, there's lots of different color morphs depending where you are in the country. Um, so they're the same species. They just have different colors going on. Um, most of them have a red tail, which is very handy, um, which you can see when they're soaring, um, really clear when they're soaring. Um, and often when they're perched, I can't see the red on this guy's tail right now, but um, if they're sitting on a power pole or something, you can often see that, that red tail. Um, most of the, the darker head, dark, like kind of dark brown colors um, and a creamy breast and belly, but that belly band, there's like a darker kind of mottledy patch around its kind of middle. Um, that's that's a, good, a good field mark. And I learned recently that when they're soaring, the leading edge of the wing, the, the wing that's kind of not the feathery bit, you know, they're like, they're like the leading edge um, is on a red-tailed hawk is dark, like on the shoulder, like the shoulder and halfway down the leading edge. And that, the only bird that has that is a red-tailed hawk. So I know for me, raptor identification can get a little tricksy, but that's a good little tip I just, just learned. So yeah, pretty cool. They're really common. I mean, I see red-tailed hawks, yeah, not an expert on raptor ID, but I see red-tailed hawks a lot more than I see any other raptors in, um, in Alabama or actually anywhere I think I've <laughs> lived, Kentucky, um, Boston and Texas. The red-tailed hawks seem to be the most common that I, that I run into. They are my favorite city bird every time I'm in a city. <laughs> Thanks, Rhea. Um, Emerson, we'll pass it back to you. Thank you for letting us get a, such a beautiful view. Oh, of course. Thanks for that awesome uh, identification trick, Rhea. I had no idea. Um, I too am not the best at raptors, but can always get a red hawk, red tailed hawk. Um, so going back to my accessibility challenges, um, just kind of being able to like find out what I'm going to get myself into before I get there and get discouraged. I think a lot of my um, challenges also come with like just feeling defeated a lot. Um, like this isn't built for me. And as someone whose chronic illness came on like well into my life, I was about 13 years old when I got Lyme disease. Um, you know, it's, it's like a challenge knowing that like, oh, I'm clearly an afterthought for this. And having even just the information or telling people like what to expect gives them so much power to like opt in for ourselves. And I can decide I'm going to do this because I know I can do it. Or, yeah, maybe I don't want to like have to take a nap in the mud today because um, that has happened before. But, you know, we do it for the birds. Ooh, I have a great blue heron right now. This is a. I just have... Ooh, what do you have? No, I don't know if anybody saw um, when uh, throughout that, that discussion about the uh, that red tail, I had a great blue hair and four bit. I had some video up for a second as I was talking around, but let's see yours. So I'm not the best at digiscoping. I um, just learned that this is like a whole term. Um, ooh, this is not very good now. Okay, here we go. Here we go. It's also kind of windy. I'm like, ooh, actually, this is an excellent time to talk about my favorite accessibility feature thing here at Huntley. Um, so let me turn my camera around. And so this is kind of like a uh, a body rest, like an arm rest, is what I like to call it. And it's there's like shorter height and a taller height, and it lets me prop myself up. So um, I get fatigued, my binoculars get pretty heavy and it can be, um, sorry, there's a, a family behind me enjoying the birds as well. Um, and that lets me kind of prop up and like sturdy myself for when I'm um, looking at birds and I'm kind of tired. So my binoculars are kind of heavy. That's another piece of equipment I'm looking into is um, like equipment that suits my abilities. And um, like, I don't know, that that work with what I'm capable of doing. And so it's kind of like more tailored to us. I guess you'd call that accessibility equipment, wouldn't you? Oh yeah, right? <laughs> I mean, if it, if it makes what you do easier, then absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely. Hey, so someone just asked in the chat, yeah. I've, I've, I've only done like four of these and I just learned how to get into the chat uh, in on my phone in Zoom um, about, um, uh, accessibility features. Someone mentioned that they didn't know about the thing that I was talking about. Go and check out vetability.org under guidance documents. There's a page called access considerations and it's got a lot of information about the things that make up a truly accessible trail. Um, and 
things things like these barriers and and all kinds of other things that you probably never really thought of if they weren't relevant to you. Um, so please share that everything on the Birdability website, any, anything on Birdability social media, follow us at Birdability on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook and YouTube um, and share that stuff because we put it out there so that more people can learn about this. Um, so we can get more trails that are designed from the start to be accessible and not an afterthought. Emerson, I'm sorry that that's how it feels. I, I understand why it really sucks. Um, yeah. It looks like Emerson, Emerson, I saw you getting some uh, waterfowl in the scope. What were you, what were you seeing just then? Um, so this is another blue heron, um, but this one is kind of more, I think we have like a blue morph and the regular morph, eBirds kind of distinguishes the two. Um, and he's sitting, or I should say they are sitting um, kind of like on this wooden perch. Um, I don't know if you can see it very well, but they're huge birds. Um, they sound like dinosaurs, if you've ever heard one, like vocalize. Um, and they kind of look prehistoric when they're flying too. They got these long snaky necks, these huge, huge wings. But he's a they little far. <laughs> they are truly the most dinosaur of all of our dinosaur birds that we have flying around um, across the globe. Um, one thing that I wanted to ask specifically, um, uh, Emerson, Freya, Joseph, um, in addition to, of course, the physical features of trails that we're on, such as the, the, the trails themselves, the width, the, um, the slope, how smooth they are, um, as well as other features that Emerson just brought up, such as places to rest and different ways to rest while you're um, traveling along a trail. Um, as far as the experiences with other people, right? Because of course the social climate and the social interactions that we have when we go exploring and go birding also feed into whether a place or an event or um, a location is accessible for us along various axes of our identities, right? And many times those intersect. So I would love to hear from you about what makes a birding experience accessible, particularly when it comes to interactions with other people, if anything comes to your mind in particular. I think just being like welcoming and happy to see other people on the trail and even just like a nice small smile and, you know, let other people know that you're excited to be in nature and happy that other people are enjoying it as well. Um, from a disability perspective, I think the hardest, one of the hardest things for me to overcome is feeling like I'm limiting other people that don't have them, if they're out birding with me. Um, like if they can, if they're bipedal and they can get to a location to get to a different habitat that I can't get to, I don't necessarily want to rob them of that opportunity. Um, the the go between of that is, it's still nice to actually have that companionship if there is somebody that is willing to go birding with me. I don't need them like necessarily on my hip the entire time. So it's like, you know, if you need to go up like that really rocky hill or something that I can't get up to to actually scope over over it to see kind of what's there, go for it, you know, and then just let me know what you actually saw down there. Mm -hmm. uh, Joseph, your, your camera and, flipped around. So just, just so you know, I just wanted to alert you that your camera was flipped around and we couldn't see you talking. We can hear you. Thank though. you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's really just kind of that it's, it's, it's kind of really more an awareness when it comes to people who are bipedal who have uh who have fewer uh mobility li limitations to kind of understand um that dynamic it, it isn't that uh, a person that has more mobility limitations needs you to stay right next to them but you know kind of go anyway if you're able to actually build that friendship or create that friendship um and Go see what it is that you need to see. And I'm going to continue to looking for birds wherever, right where it is that I'm at. Uh, this is that's, kind of being adaptable to the situation. That's that's awesome, Joseph. Thanks for sharing. So I, I've heard similar things said for a lot of different folks um, with access challenges, birding, not wanting to be kind of a burden is the words they've used on, on other folks they're birding with. Um, and Virginia Rose, who also uses a manual wheelchair, she she's shared with me a couple of times about um, well-meaning, you know, friends and people in the birding group there she's out with who are like, oh, come, come, keep coming. And she's like, no, no, I'm happy to stay here. Like, that's a bit steep for me. Like, it's fine. I'm, I'm happy. And they're like, no, you're coming. And they're like, push her along. And she's like, no, 
I actually just really wanted to stay here. <laughs> um, don't like, I know you're trying to be kind, but like, don't force the participation. Like just trust if someone says, I would rather stay here. Like Virginia says what you just said to Joseph, she's going to find birds stationary, right. hanging out, waiting for folks to come back. Like it's not a problem. And if, if someone is saying, I don't want to come, like <laughs> respect that. Definitely. And I mean, um, the flip side of that is one of the things that has always kind of stood out to me when it comes to like my strongest relationships and friendships is that there, there's a thin line between that. So like uh, that person's experience as far as them not wanting to go. Um, but on the, the opposite side of that coin is people assuming what you can't do. And so they don't actually encourage you or challenge you to actually get from point A to point B. And so like, you know, what I like actually for my friends is if there's a barrier between me getting from this location to that location, and I think that we can actually solve it with the assistance of somebody with fewer uh, mobility limitations, then let's get it done. You know, like it, it, I, I want to potentially put myself in precarious situations and get into trouble, but I also want friends that are gonna help me get out of it. You know, like don't assume that I don't actually, that what, what I can or can't do, don't assume that I don't want to actually get on the ground with my camera because this, there may be some sort of pain involved. I mean, I lay on gravel to take photos of snakes and stuff like that all the time. It's, it's just part of what I want to do. Um, so it's really, it's, it's, you know, listening and actually taking what is actually said seriously and doing it, being able to do it kind of quickly, right? It's just like, it isn't, it's not an argument. If somebody says they don't want to go, that should be the end of the discussion. Um, but if it's me, I want to go unless I absolutely certainly cannot. That's they, yeah, that's a really good point. Thank you, Joseph. Um, I'm 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 glad you're here sharing all this with with us all. Um, and we all get to learn from you. The I, I, having followed I you on Instagram for a little bit of time, um, at Reels on Wheels, you all follow follow Joseph. Um, um, I know I that. Hey. Um, I think it's a Merlin. Visibility is pretty low. Really? Um, oh, oh, jealous. Ooh. Hold on. I'm getting shaky on my camera. Um, very sliver. I'm so sorry for anyone with low vision. This is not, m not my best work. There. That's all right. That's all right, Emerson. Did you scope things? What it is? Tell us about it, though. Then, then we can all learn a little bit more about a melon oh hey here we go field guide i brought my um i brought my handy dandy bird book um and so this is the page on the merlin it's um it's about two feet long or wide i should say it's uh i don't know steve do you have anything about this bird uh it looks like an adult male i've got a bad bad view of him but he's clearly a merlin clearly a merlin why why is it a merlin i'm looking up underneath and i can see these patterns down here See the pattern that's very distinctive and it turns into stripes um, and he's light under the chin he's light under the chin see the chin? oh yeah yeah just without the phone it is you can definitely see those markings he's cute i don't know if you guys can see the back of my uh lcd very well but i'm looking at uh some pie build grebes right now these are like super common of the grebes uh here at hefner lake I see dozens, if not hundreds, of them throughout the uh, the colder months. Uh, I'm still waiting on their more colorful cousins um, with like the uh, uh, <clears throat> sorry, I completely like blank there for a second. But we also get uh, western grebes and ear grebes that are a lot more colorful. Uh, pie bill grebes, they're easily identified by their their bill. Uh, which has, uh, it's dual colored uh, in black and white and has a, a bit of a black stripe down the middle of it. And that's what makes them most easily identifiable. Um, the rest of their body is mostly kind of just a drab tan. Nice. We are, I, I am so excited about these waterfowl and falcons. Merlins are falcons for those of you who um, may not have encountered Merlins before. Um, Really quickly, I just wanted to alert you. In the chat, I have put Joseph's Instagram, which we mentioned is Reels on Wheels, and his website. Um, oh, Freya, what is that? There's a turkey vulture soaring around. That's the tree that that red-tailed hawk has departed from. Um, but there's a, t there, well, he's disappearing behind that tree. There is a turkey vulture 
um, there's black vultures here too. And there's a nice, easy way to tell them apart when they're, um, when they're on the wing. Uh, if you see them up close, you'll be able to see that um, turkey vultures have a red head black vultures have a black head um, that's helpful but they're both big big chunky carrion eaters um, turkey vultures the leading edge of the wing is black and under the the trailing edge is white or like kind of silvery I reckon it's more like silvery color black vultures uh, their fingertips are white um, and the rest of the wing is black so you can you can tell and, and it's it's really clear so they're they're handy um, <laughs> to ID I reckon they're such funny birds at, at, at dusk, um, turkey vultures seem to be really social. You usually see them ones or twos, uh, you know, up in the sky, but at dusk, they come in and land like on big, like power electricity pylons or like I've seen them on big billboards and, and there'll be like five pylons in a row. And then there'll be one with like 30 turkey vultures on it. And then there'll be like another five pylons. And then like, why is that the pylon? <laughs> what's going on like everyone wants to be right there um it cracks me up <laughs> that's awesome that's awesome um Freya thanks for pointing out the vultures to us we love our vultures Emerson I so we were just watching a red-tailed hawk kind of soar around and then it went behind the trees and probably like 200 American crows started cawing <gasps> and just Whoa. like above the trees was just like this cloud of blackbirds just erupting out of the it was so cool oh my goodness oh my gosh That's we're getting awesome. real good biotic I, interactions this afternoon <laughs> um, there's an eastern phoebe here um which is a kind of fly catcher they're very nice and they say their name they say phoebe when they call and the, there's a, quite a few different fly catchers that look relatively similar kind of similar sort of sizes oh, phoebe. there he goes bye friend oh just over here into this tree. Phoebes flick their tail kind of almost, it's not constant, but it's close to constant. It's kind of hard to see them right in the, the sticky sticks, but um, they flick their tails when they're stationary. Um, and there's other flycatchers that don't move their tails as much as that. So that that helps you know if it's a Phoebe. Uh, I think they're really sweet. They seem kind of friendly, like they're not too, too scared, um, which is nice. You can get close to them and hang out with them for a little bit. Very cool, very cool. Before we get too far away, I wanted to say, so I put Joseph Saunders' uh, Instagram and website in the chat. So please look for that Reels on Wheels and his website, paraherpetological.com. Joseph, tell us about your photography um, and what people can do to engage with it and learn more. So one thing that I did um, just this morning before I left the house is I created a code for anybody that is actually listening to this that is either has their own limitations with accessibility or supports people with those limitations, uh, there is a code. Uh, it is ACCESS, all caps, and you can use that code for $5 off anything on my website. And this is good for the end, to the end of the month. Um, so, <clears throat> also, so when it comes to supporting, I mean, it really, it comes down to purchasing art. I offer fine art prints of some of my my favorite images, uh, I curated four different calendars, one for jumping spiders, one for reptiles and amphibians, one for birds, one for general arthropods, so all that I see around Oklahoma. Um, and uh, I also have a Patreon, which helps out tremendously. Uh, it really, uh, all of it really just goes to support what it is that I already do. It isn't, uh, I, I don't, earn anything that makes anything extravagant it just allows me a little more ease when it comes to being able to travel when it comes to being able to take photographs and just puts me in a better position to uh, do what I do at the quality of the level that I pursue to do it at. Joseph that is amazing and I encourage you to follow him by his prints his prints are not only you know you know, birds and things you can see really easily with a negative, naked eye, his macro photography, which is like up close photos of very small things like spiders and other and insects is out of this world. Y'all have to see it. So follow him on at Reels on Wheels on Instagram at your earliest convenience. Joseph, thank you so much for plugging that and for creating an ax or a, a, a code for people to get a discount. That is so awesome. Thank you so much for that, Joseph. Um, Freya. 
I'm looking at a song sparrow, which is not what I was about to tell you all about, but he just showed up. Song sparrows are so nice. And I've had to work on one of my internal biases with sparrows because I'm from Australia. And in Australia, the only sparrows are house sparrows and they're not native and they cause a lot of problems. And so when I first moved to the US, I just sort of dismissed every sparrow. Um, this is six years later and I'm still still working on, <laughs> on this bias, but song sparrows, um, really nice. Oh, there he goes. They're um, really streaky on the breast and they have like, to me, it looks like a thumbprint, like a big, thick blob right on the breast. Um, and that's that helps me know that that's a song sparrow. They sing really nicely back. Patrick, my husband, he's in the army. And so we got moved around a lot. But when we were at Fort Knox in Kentucky, we had a um, song sparrow in our backyard who used to sit on top of the fence and just sing his little heart out. And there was such a like lack of trees and stuff in that neighborhood that the tiny little piece of nature just was so, so lovely. Um, but I wanted to show you really quickly two things in the chat. Tell me if you can see a difference between, there's two picnic tables here, that's fine. This picnic table and this picnic table, if you can spot the difference and why it matters uh, in the conversation about accessibility in the outdoors. I'll give you a couple of couple of seconds. Um, what's going on with this picnic table? Looks like, Looks like one of them was. Oh wait, it's on the chat. Let me see. No, no, you tell us, Joseph, because folks in the chat have got it. <laughs> um, the other one is longer, so I mean, it's easier to actually pull up to if you're using a wheelchair and you're not able to transfer onto the other onto the bench. Yes, 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 yes. Wheelchair users can scooch in under this extended part of the table. That's awesome. Like, why not? And and folks who don't use wheelchairs can sit here too. So if you're putting out picnic tables somewhere, like, why wouldn't you just go ahead and put an accessible picnic table out there and include people right from the start without even having to, without even having to try, really? I mean, there's lots of stuff when we start talking about physical accessibility. There's a lot of stuff that you can just do, like having accessible port loos instead of the regular sized ones. And then everyone can use the accessible port loo but only some people can use the regular sized ones. Like, let's just take that route from the beginning. It, it makes so much more sense and it, it, it helps everybody benefit. I'd rather use the accessible port loo Like it's easier to get in and out of. It doesn't feel as like sticky and gross. Um, also known as porta potty in case it's not coming wait, through on the, on the uh, closed couch. <laughs> See, um, I'm, I would say I'm not even going to get started on porta potties, but, but I am. Because, like, even like this lake here, the, one of the reasons that I come to this one is, is not because of, like, the accessibility to bathrooms. It's because it is in a very urban area, and there are very few of them. And, you know, when it comes to people, um, like paras like myself uh, or uh, people with other uh, mobility limitations, you know, we, we can't do like the, you know, the, the yoga poses when it comes to a toilet to actually make sure that we're touching as little of it as possible. It's, it's we, we, we don't have that option. It's full contact. So I'm not using nobody's porta potty, but I do. And I didn't even realize I was thinking about this actually since we talked last night. Like I have an exit strategy to any of the public locations or like private stores or whatever that is closest to this lake in case I actually do need to get to one quickly. Um, but yeah, like the whole accessibility of it when it comes to the lake or any kind of rural areas is terrible. Like writ large, it's just terrible across the board. Hey, so speaking of speaking of um, lakes and dodgy bathrooms and um, by the way, um, Someone, oh, my memory, I think I'm distracted by this amazing conversation and all these birds. Someone wrote something in the chat, uh, which makes me want to comment on, oh, oh, it was about accessibility of locations. Yes, and trying to improve local trails. Yes, okay. Um, you don't have to like completely rip out a trail and spend millions of dollars, which probably is an exaggeration, of fixing stuff to make it like a thousand percent perfect. There are very few truly wonderfully absolutely perfectly accessible locations out there um little tiny things like an accessible picnic table or you know adding a couple of benches with armrests um little things like that make a big big difference to a lot of people and there's such a diversity of disability that not everyone needs the same stuff so like i really appreciate benches i know emerson does as well with her with her fatigue um but 
benches probably don't matter a whole lot for Joseph um, in his wheelchair. So, you know, there's, there's lots of different things different people benefit from and you don't have to have it a thousand percent right. You just have to try. Um, and, and, and as you get more grants and more funding, you know, just keep, keep working on it slowly, slowly. Every little bit helps. Uh, and if your location, by the way, birding trail, um, bird blind, observation platform, car birding site is reasonably accessible um we, i've quantified that a little further on, on our website but um we would love for you to submit a birdability site review to help populate the birdability map which is a crowdsourced resource um talking about in detail the accessibility of birding locations because so many places websites will just say we have an accessible trail and there is so many components to what makes that up. And, and very often it's not actually as accessible as they're claiming. And so knowing ahead of time what is actually available is really, really valuable. So um, the birdability site review is not hard. Um, you just have to tell us what is and isn't there. You don't have to decide if anyone could or couldn't manage that. Let them make that decision for themselves. Um, but that's a really great way to um, help out hey emerson's looking in binoculars but i also want to ask joseph a little bit about car birding because i know a lot of folks really love car birding and it's definitely a perfectly valid really awesome often very accessible way to go birding so emerson if you want to tell us a little bit about what you're seeing but then um joseph I, i'd love to hear about your car birding experiences and what helps you what, what if you have any tips or tricks for car birding and finding good hang car on, birding sites. Hang on. can, can y'all see Oh, where'd it go? I lost it. Can y'all see my screen? A little bit. I saw something soaring. Yeah, that's the bald eagle. <gasps> you see, if you see it, Pan, you can maybe, might be able to wake, make out the white tail against the can contrast of the very dark body. Lift your phone a little higher because we're missing the top half of the screen. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Little bit. Yeah. <clears throat> That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, I, got, I got to find the bird again. There it goes. Bird's like center of the screen. It's a very small black dot, basically. I'm trying to keep it in the middle of the screen. It's in the middle right now. I'm, uh, I found an American black duck um, who's uh, disappeared. Who is it back? I'm hoping it will fly closer because if it flies closer, then I'll have a much easier time actually being able to get a decent visual on it. But can you hear the ducks quacking in the background? A bunch of mallards overhead. It is. I, I will say right now, Huntley Meadows on a Saturday is usually jammed packed, and I mean like. You're having trouble walking on the boardwalk. There's an awesome boardwalk here um, that um, I have a birding partner I go birding with a lot who's um, using a manual wheelchair right now as he recovers from a hip replacement. Um, and when it's busy, like we have to like be moving photographers, tripods, scopes just to get through the trail, um, which I guess is kind of a comment on the social situation of birding and how it's accessible based on how people use um, that specific space. But for right now, um, I'm neurodivergent, I have ADHD, and that causes a lot of like overstimulation and getting overwhelmed and um, like emotional regulation kind of stuff like that. And so having to be this empty is like the greatest present of this month. Like this is spectacular and I'm thoroughly enjoying it. That's awesome. And one thing I wanted to note, I put in the chat, so Freya was mentioning the site review that BirdAbility offers, the BirdAbility map in uh, collaboration with National Audubon Society. I put that link in the chat. You may have to scroll a little bit to find it. Um, but it is so important for the reason that Emerson was saying, like one of the accessibility challenges that she described earlier about not knowing exactly what to expect at a location that she's going birding. Um, and this is the case across the board, knowing what the features are at a trail and what it's like is so helpful for making trails more accessible. Information is key. Um, so if you go birding on a trail and it's a trail that you think could be a place that is accessible um, for, for people who experience a, a particular kind or different kinds of uh, disabilities or access challenges, we absolutely encourage you when you when you create, when you fill out that, that form, submit that site review, it stays geolocated to the map 
for in perpetuity. And so if someone's in the area and they want to know if there's an accessible birding location potentially nearby, they can look at your site review and get all the information that you offer to inform themselves about whether or not that location would be good for them to visit. So please do visit birdability.org and look specifically at the birdability map and submit site reviews at locations that you go birding. Um, someone asked, where is Emerson? Um, Emerson, can you describe one more time where you are? Yeah, going birding so I'm at a place called Huntley Meadows. It's in Alexandria, Virginia. So we're honestly like five minutes from um, Washington, DC. Um, there's like, we're surrounded by major roads on all three sides, but you would absolutely never know. Um, I wanna say like 150 years ago, some really awesome people decided that this was important to preserve um, for all people to enjoy like into the future. And so we're really lucky that in such a developed area, we have such a wonderful piece of nature. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you so much, Emerson. Um, there are some questions that are coming into the chat. Um, what I would ask people to do, if you do have a question, if you could put them into the Q&A function that is either there's a downy woodpecker just now. You may, if you if you heard it or if you didn't, it kind of sounds like a downward, kind of like a. That's what it sounds like in my best impression of the downy woodpecker. Um, anyway, if you have a question for our uh, guests today, please go ahead and put it in the Q and A. But I saw I caught a question in the chat where um, someone asked specifically. Let me pull it back up just so I have it. Um, Kathleen asked, "Do you mind speaking on accessibility to reach people who are unable to leave their homes? Um, what do you what you're doing right now allows so many to watch from home and take part." We take lots of videos to reach people at home or in senior facilities, and I wonder if they are as helpful as I hope. So um, if anyone would like to speak to how to make birding and enjoyment of birds accessible for people who are not able to leave their home, that would be awesome. I mean, I, more uh, programs like this, and I would set up as many bird feeders around that facility as possible, make them post the windows so that they can actually see, uh, equip uh, the facilities with binoculars so they can get a closer look. Uh, and try to work with any agencies that are able to provide these resources. Um, local oh, just, could you, sorry, or, could you flip your camera, Joseph? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I keep doing that. My bad. Thank you. My bad. No, you're fine. Um, no, I was saying like, so like in the case of like, if it's elders or if it is any sort of like communal living, um, basically making, creating a green space that's nearby where you can uh, have uh, bird feeders or anything like that, like anything like that. Um, or also like binoculars in case they can't actually get outside and make those bird feeders close to windows and equip them with binoculars so that they can see through those windows, windows and get a closer look at the birds that visit. Um, and also like programs like this, because you know, you're only, you, you have a limited, uh, a limited diversity when it comes to yard birds, you know, you're not probably, you're probably not going to find a bald eagle, uh, in somebody's backyard. Uh, like what I've been observing today and many of these other water birds. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's really kind of the basis of it. Support more programs like this, uh, find people that are willing to kind of set up bird feeders, uh, talk to, uh, to um, the companies that create optics and see if they might be willing to actually donate any sets of binoculars for these purposes. A lot of times that they are. Thank you so much, Joseph, absolutely. Anyone else want to put in? Yeah, to echo um, what Joseph was saying is these virtual events are like next level awesome. I um, went on a virtual um, birding trip to Costa Rica, like a place I would never physically be able to like go birding deep in the jungle of. Um, and like, you know, sometimes my pain level is so high and my fatigue is so extreme that like I just stay in bed for three or four days at a time. And like that's that's my life with chronic Lyme disease. Um, and it can be like a really sad, depressing um, like periods, but I like have started watching um, nest box cams on YouTube and like, they just like, they bring me so much joy. And it, cause it, I think it really is birds. Birds are, ooh, Freya has something cool. Ooh. Yeah, turkey vulture just coming in over the river, really nice. Um, they're they're so fun to watch and they they that v shape someone mentioned in the chat they fly oh i don't know if you could see that let me try it he's going to be hard to get in the binoculars um because he's moving so much but um they sort of teeter on their when they're flying often when they're soaring they, there we go look at that oh magic um 
Oh, there's some kids here. One just asked if that was a bald eagle. No, the bald eagle's in Oklahoma. Um, yeah, um, I did want to mention, yeah, thank you, Emerson. The webcams. Webcams are a totally awesome. There's um, there's a whole stack of um, Cornell Lab have a whole lot of different webcams set up um, at their saps like a woods. They have some set up in West Texas that's just mad full of crazy hummingbirds. Um, they've got one in Panama. Um, yeah, webcams are, are really cool. You can just have one running on a TV in like a you know community room or something all the time. Like that'd be that'd be great bringing birds into people's people's lives. Um, there's a woodpecker over there somewhere that does not sound like a downy woodpecker that based on its drum. I don't know where it is. I just heard it over to the left. But um, um, I do before... put the link in the chat for the bird cams, just so you know, so you can click that and Thank you. browse. <laughs> there's a bunch of others too. Like you can search on YouTube and they just have live streams going all the time. Um, hey, I wanted to mention something because I don't want to forget. Um, Birdability, we have t-shirts. We have t-shirts, but they're only available in batches. And hey, Emerson's showing hers. Um, uh, yeah, here's mine. Uh, it's purple. It says Birdability, the logo on the top left. Uh, here is my lovely model husband, Patrick, showing his room around for me, Patrick. There we go. Yeah. On the back, but 30 is for everybody. And then our website, so you can find out how to make this statement true uh, in every way. Um, you can get yours right now. Uh, on bonfire um and we've got they're only available till december 9th so, though so don't like put this off just go do this thing uh if you want some there's there's different colors uh, and there's even uh for the first time uh we've got a long sleeved navy blue long sleeved shirt and a couple of hoodies um so um christmas presents or birthday presents or just general awesomeness the more people we can share this message with um the more we can encourage to get out and enjoy birds and the more people who may be helping to make this a true, really, it's a true statement already, but, but um, you know, ap applicable in their local areas as well. So um, please, please go check out that. Um, I don't know if you can throw that link in the chat, um, but if you just Google bonfire vertibility, you'll probably um, find that pretty easily. Awesome, awesome. Um, I'll look for that link and try to plug it in before we wrap up. Um, but as we're getting to the end of the hour, um, I wanted to make sure that you all were aware of the ways that you could support the people who are um, here as guests in the Georgia Audubon Birdability um, Virtual Accessible Field Trip. Of course, we put Joseph Saunders' um, email and um, Instagram handle in the chat. So please be sure to um, uh, follow him, purchase his, his prints um, and support the incredible work that he's doing. Um, Emerson, do you wanna tell us a little bit about the website that I'm going to put in the chat in just a second? Yeah, um, I'm building a website. It's a non-carbon life form and it's really confusing and I'm teaching myself all new skills. Um, it's called Talk Birdies, the number two me. Um, and it's really just, to do put all of my birding things in one place so my brain like works better um but yeah follow me along for my adventures it'll be a lot about my um kind of coming to terms with having like owning my disability there's a long time where i thought i wasn't disabled and like it's honestly been like really powerful to like own that i am and that that's not like a bad thing or a dirty word Awesome. Thank you so much, Emerson. I put your website as well as the handle for your Instagram, which is also at talkbirdies to the number me. Um, so feel free to follow. Uh, we encourage you to follow Emerson um, on uh, online as well. Um, and Freya, specifically, how can people support, in addition to engage with birdability and use the many resources that you've talked about today, how can birdability, in addition to buying a shirt, um, support your organization? Yes, thank you. Yes, yes. Um, so as a nonprofit, donations are really, really important for us um, to keep up the work that we are doing. Um, so you can donate. Any donation is appreciated. Um, Vertibility.org slash donate um, is where that's at. Um, donations are tax deductible and um, we, we really appreciate that. Sorry, there's a boat driving down the river that's kind of loud, if you can hear that. Um, also, um, sharing our resources, liking us, following us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, um, sharing our posts with people you think will benefit from that, um, commenting on them so more people see them, that kind of stuff, like that really helps um, and, and maybe more accessible um, to folks who maybe can't donate. Um, 
buy a t-shirt uh buy 20 t-shirts no that's a lot maybe i don't know if it's up to you <laughs> and talk about this talk about this with people um that you're out birding with um share about birdability if you meet someone on the trail who has a visible um disability although many many access uh, challenges are not visible um you know, let them know about bird ability just in case it's of interest to them. Um, talk about it with your bird club or your Audubon chapter or um, your friends. Um, tell them all to, to donate and, and tell them all about all this stuff because um, the more people who learn about this, um, yeah, the sooner we'll, we'll get to our ultimate goal of not being needed anymore. When we don't have a job to do, that's when we've succeeded. So when all this stuff is just always happening, it's always built in, birders and bird organizations know already how to be welcoming and inclusive of birders with access challenges by the way um speaking of that there's a um, guidance document about welcoming and inclusive birders and there's another one about a in, um inclusive organization so check that out for some ideas um and follow us and if you want to come birding with me um you can follow me at the ot birder on instagram Thank awesome. you. Thank you for coming. Um, thank you, Emerson. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you, Beverly. Thank you, Karina. Thank you, George. Oh, I'm really sorry. I'm, I live in Oklahoma, and we every Saturday we have like a test of the tornado sirens, and you may be hearing that right now. I'm sorry if that's loud and obnoxious. <laughs> You're totally fine. You're just... Safety first. <laughs> but, but better than that, um, I just I found uh, where'd you go? This killdeer is just kind of hanging out and chilling by the lake. Can y'all see him? Yes, that's amazing! They love to hang out by the shorelines, very fast birds, identified by the, um, the black stripe, the black ring around their neck. Oh, there's a second one actually that completely eluded me. It was probably sitting here the entire time. See, it's a little bit closer. So. Killdeer are also a namesayer, aren't they? Their call is like, kill, kill. I have, I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, I used to hear it like, kill deer, kill deer. It's kind of how it sounds to me. Again, oh. I have limited impression of <laughs> accuracy. Um, what a good shot. Hey, go. I Oh, in the chat, I just saw Kathleen share that she's noticed that there's no pin sites in Alberta um, on the birdability um, map and is committing to 10, 15 to 20 um, sites in the summer. So, hey, we please don't just put any birding location on there. If it's like full of steps um, or it's like super muddy, like that's not going to be all that accessible to most folks with access challenges. So only the ones that are kind of reasonably accessible. Um, there's more information about that on the birdability website under um, get involved, contribute to the birdability map. There's more detail about what, what we really want on the birdability map there, but thank you. That would be amazing, Kathleen. Thank you for um, for that goal. And, and we look forward to hearing how you go. And um, if you share on social media, you tag us at birdability. I'd love to repost what you're doing. And yeah, thank you. Thank you everyone. It's 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 so much fun birding with you all and um, really, really enjoyed learning and, and hanging out with you today. Yes, this has been wonderful. Thank you for hanging out with us. We hope that you have a wonderful rest of your day. Emerson, Freya, Joseph, Beverly, thank you for being here. And we'll see you all next time. This is a quarterly event. So we'll see you all um, in the spring. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.